labels for everyone. Uh, my name is Brandy Allen. I am the positive supports consultant lead for the North region of the state. Um, we actually, my team focuses on teaching these positive behavior support strategies all across the state um, to all kinds of different audiences. I'm excited to share this information with you today. Um, I would like to get to know you all a little bit. Um, the way that we'll communicate throughout this class will be through the chat box. So if you look on the right side of your screen, you should see a little chat box. Um, it's going to say chat. And then there's a little downward facing triangle next to that word. Um, if your chat box isn't open, you might want to go ahead and click that little downward facing arrow to get it open. You should be able to enter messages um, and just hit enter and those will pop up for everyone in the class. Um, so I would ask you all to, if you could just tell me your name, maybe what organization you're from and what your role is in that organization. That will help me kind of know who my audience is today. Uh, thank you. Welcome, Charlie, with the Kansas City Regional Office. Nice. We have Wendy from Rediscover. You're a pro program manager. Welcome. Kelsey is a team leader at Northwest Missouri Psych Rehab. Welcome. And I'm not sure if we have anyone else. I thought we might have had one more participant. Hi, here we go. Jan, who's a social worker at Northwest Missouri Psych Rehab. All right, welcome everybody. I'm excited to share this with you. So there is a lot of material to get through in this two hour session. So I'm gonna go ahead and just jump right in. As we go through the class, um, it will be interactive where I'll ask you to type in the chat box and share responses. So uh, especially with this small of a group, I really hope that you all are able to participate fully. Okay. Uh, you also might want to grab some paper and a pencil to take notes or to work on some of the activities if we get to the practice activities at the end. And let's talk a little bit about what we're going to be going over today. So we are going to be discussing a positive behavior support program, um, what positive behavior supports are. They're typically universal strategies. Um, we're going to talk about some fundamental facts about behavior and how to categorize those behaviors into four different types. Um, by categorizing those behaviors, that helps us really target how to change those behaviors. We're going to be talking about what coercion is, um, what punishment is, and what some of the effects of both are. We want to, we're going to talk about why you should try to avoid coercion and punishment um, and talk about those 10 examples of coercion that we're all guilty of um, and we should try to avoid. We're also going to be talking about how you can use positive behavior support to improve your interactions with others, as well as to improve behaviors. Um, especially if we have undesirable behaviors. Sometimes our reaction can be a big help to try to change those behaviors. Uh, so one question before we move on, um, when we talk about behavior, um, we usually think of it as something that we want to try to get rid of. Um, so can you all think back in your experiences and maybe when you've encountered an undesirable behavior, um, how did you respond to that? What was your technique to try to get rid of that behavior? And you can just type your responses in the chat box. And I'll give you an example while y'all are typing. 
Um, I'm a parent. Um, and, you know, every, every kid has a cell phone now. And so when my child has undesirable or inappropriate behaviors with her cell phone, uh, usually to try to deter that behavior, I will take her cell phone away um, for a specific amount of time. So that's my response to try to get rid of her inappropriate or undesirable behavior. So Wendy says it depends on the situation, but she sometimes uses modeling as a tool. That's a really good one. Like you model the behaviors that you want to see. Does anyone else have an example of how you've tried to get rid of behaviors in the past? <laughs> As a new parent, when there's an undesirable behavior, ignore the person until it stops. Okay. Very, very typical, Charlie. Very typical. We're going to talk a little bit about that later about how we can use positive behavior support rather than ignoring. Um, and sometimes that will help the behavior. Kelsey says she has a child displaying negative behaviors at school. She'll use a sticker chart for good behaviors um, and reinforce the appropriate skills used when they're upset. So, yeah, that's a really good example of those positive behaviors. Randy, I think we lost sound. Hear me now? Am I back? Yes. Okay. All right. I apologize for that. <laughs> Thank you guys for your patience there. Hopefully we continue to have a good connection here. I'm not sure what's going on. Um, Chelsea had also said to, yeah, to reinforce those appropriate behaviors. All right. So let's go ahead and talk a little bit about what positive behavior support is. Um, there's a lot that goes into that definition. Uh, there has been a science of behavior or behavior analysis for many years, since the 1940s, and there have been hundreds of thousands of studies uh, done about positive behavior support um, that show that these techniques really do use or, or really do work um, when we use them. Uh, the PBS model uh, is based on the public health model to structure interventions. And this is exactly how my team is organized with the state. Um, if you look at the little triangle on this slide, my team is the tier one team or the universal strategies team. And that is the green base of the triangle. That basically means that we are trying to put strategies in place that support the quality of life for the entire population. In a healthy population, 80 to 90% of people will only need these universal supports for a high quality of life. If we move up to the middle section, the yellow center, that is the population who might be at risk. Um, they might have uh, some factors that are causing them to be at a higher risk uh, and they need some extra intervention. So a lot of times what that looks like is just a little extra scoop of those universal strategies and maybe some targeted interventions that are intended to be short term 
and they will fade out as that risk decreases. In a healthy population, about 10 to 15% might need this second level of support. And then we have the red top of the triangle, and that represents those individuals who are in crisis and they are in need of short-term intensive supports. In a healthy population, about 5% of people might need that red, that highest level of intervention. So most of today's training is going to be focused on the base of this triangle, those universal support strategies. Um, and we're really going to be talking about how you can focus on the positive um, and, and that will help you build more positive relationships with others. And it will also help you to better intervene when you have undesirable behaviors. So when we say it like that, we say like, oh, we have to be kind and caring all the time, right? We, we have to avoid creating or responding with a response that might make the situation worse. Um, we often think that in our society, we've all been raised to think that there needs to be some type of worsening consequence or punishment in order for people to learn. Um, and sometimes we have people who think that by responding always in that positive way, that we're just letting people get away with the undesirable behavior without any, co any consequences or any accountability. Um, but the fact is that when you can continue to be kind and non-emotional in your responses to undesirable behavior, you can be more effective in helping calm that situation down. Um, it makes the situation where it, it doesn't become worse. Um, and you have to recognize that just because you're responding with that kindness and caring in that moment, it doesn't mean that we're not going to address that behavior. We just might not address that behavior in that particular moment. Um, this is a really hard thing to do to try to respond with that kindness and caring all the time. It takes a lot of practice and mindfulness. Um, and even those of us who teach this, um, we still find ourselves not responding in this kind and caring way all the time. We're human. Um, we all have a, you know, a tendency to react that first reaction, that negative reaction sometimes. So, like I said, it really does need to be something that you mindfully put into place. So let's talk a little bit about the definition of behavior. Let me get to where I can type here. So for those of you who are online here, can, can you type out maybe a definition of what you think behavior is and i'm going to type what you guys respond on this slide there is a little bit of a lag so as i type you might not see it for a second so what do you think the definition of behavior is All right, Charlie's got in here, actions or activities that conform to societal standards. Okay, I like that. All right, Jan said actions. So behavior is actions. And Wendy says that 
Behavior means a person operates within their world. The actions seen, heard, and felt by the world. Okay, I like that. Kelsey says, the way that someone acts in response to a situation they're in. Okay, you guys are right on it here. Um, we're actually going to go over the behavior, the definition of behavior. And it is anything a person does that can be seen and counted. Um, you guys were right on it, talking about the actions that we see, we hear, we feel. Um, yeah, th those are behaviors, right? Um, anything a person does that can be seen and counted. And we always want to put the test of whether an action is a behavior or not to the dead man's test. Um, if a dead man could do that action, then it's not a behavior. Uh, behavior has to be something that a person does that can be seen and counted. Let me get to my right slide here. Okay, so in thinking about that, behavior being something, an action that can be seen or counted, can you guys give me some examples of behaviors? And we're gonna we're gonna make a list on this slide here. I'd like to get like, oh, I don't know, eight or ten examples of behavior. So give me some specific examples of behavior. Oh, you guys are throwing them out here. Okay, so we have throwing a chair. We have aggressive verbal outburst. Lashing out physically or striking. Can you guys give me a few more? Crying uncontrollably. Smiling. What about jumping or spitting or running? Those could all be behaviors, right? Singing, we've got singing in there, refusing to ambulate. Okay, thank you all for giving me some really good examples that we're gonna talk about as we go on here. Um, as we said earlier, behavior is anything a person does that can be seen and counted. Um, but as we look at our list here, uh, would you say that the majority of this list is more positive behavior or negative behavior? And you can just type your response in the chat box there. Yeah, it's, it's more negative, right? Um, and that is because when we use the word behavior, we usually have a tendency to think of behavior as something negative um, rather than positive. But honestly, behavior can be positive or negative. It is any action that could be seen or counted. So 
thank you all for participating in that list. We're going to come back to that um, as we move on here. So you guys did a really great job of talking about behaviors as specific actions rather than categories for the most part. Um, if we go back and look at our list, I, I think I did see maybe one category. Um, and I would say it was aggressive verbal outburst. Um, that's a really good description of a behavior, but we would really want to break that down into something more specific. So what does that aggressive look like? Um, can you guys give me some examples of maybe specific behaviors that might be labeled as aggressive? We probably have a few in here in our list already. So if we had an aggressive verbal outburst, what, what would that look like? Okay, I see threats, um, graphic threats of harm, name calling, derogatory language. Yeah, exactly. Um, so threats, um, what else did we have in there? Oh, name calling, yes. Derogatory language. Yeah, so those might be more specific examples of how to describe that behavior. Um, and it, when, if you were documenting what was happening during this aggressive verbal outburst, you would probably want to specifically write what names were being said, what, what words were being used that were derogatory, and the specific threats that were being made. So, yeah. Um, in this example um, of a category rather than a specific action of rude, um, we could say instead of just, well, that person was rude, we could say, well, that person was staring at me and they cut in line and they said, look at that person. What were they thinking? So we can demonstrate rude by using those more specific behaviors that we see, those specific actions that we can see and count. Um, the reason that we want to be specific in describing behavior is that what looks like aggressive to one person might not look the same to someone else. Um, and so we really want to break it down into those specific actions that we are seeing. Let's talk a little bit about those four categories of behavior that I mentioned earlier. So when we see and count behaviors, we can usually categorize that behavior into one of four categories. There are either two categories that are desirable or two that are undesirable. Um, when we're talking about problem behaviors and desirable behaviors, for example, we want to make sure that we're identifying the specific actions that are occurring. Um, and we want to make sure that we are able to be clear and consistent in our responses to those behaviors, um, because we really want to make sure that we're being effective at improving the quality of life for other individuals. So significant desirable behaviors are those that are the most important. They're often the ones that we try to teach someone to do or to help them do at the right time, um, more or more often than they do them currently. Um, an example of a significant behavior might be um, learning to brush your teeth independently. Um, that's something that's going to improve your quality of life. It's a good life skill that's going to benefit that individual's quality of life for a long time. Can you guys think of any examples of significant behaviors? Significant desirable behaviors. So things that are going to improve that individual's quality of life. A lot of times they are life skills. Oh, 
Oh yeah, Charlie says learning to put your clothes on independently. Definitely. Yeah, that's that's a good life skill that we want everyone to learn. Wendy says a workout routine or meal planning. Yeah, those are really good skills that we want individuals to have to be able to be healthy and to care for themselves. Yeah, great examples. Thank you. So let's talk a little bit about this next category, the just okay behaviors. Um, these fall under the desirable side. Just okay behaviors are those that we often overlook unless somebody is not doing them. Um, for example, it might be walking versus running in public spaces or closing the door when you come in from outside, um, pushing in your chair when you get up from the table, things like that. Um, it, we don't often recognize them because we expect them, um, but we we typically don't notice them unless someone doesn't do that behavior. Can you guys think of any other examples of just okay behaviors? Those things that we we typically just overlook, we expect people to do them, and it's only when they don't do them that we notice. Bathing, yeah, exactly, yeah. So, you know, that that hygiene, that personal hygiene, really that's a just okay behavior, right? Wearing deodorant, that's just okay. But we definitely notice when people don't bathe and, and they're kind of smelly, right? <laughs> but it's not something that we we typically reinforce either like, oh, thank you for taking a bath today, right? <laughs> so yeah, that's a great example of those just okay behaviors. Yeah, Charlie says saying please and thank you, using manners is a big one. Um, we kind of just expect that, but when when we see people not using please and thank you, then we notice, right? Yeah, really good examples, guys. So let's jump over to the undesirable side. Uh, we have serious undesirable behavior. Um, these are the behaviors that cause real dangerous situations. Um, they're things that might cause harm to oneself, to others, to property, or they could be illegal. Um, these are those serious behaviors that we definitely need to intervene if we see these happening. Can you guys give me some examples of a serious behavior? Yeah, Kelsey says self-harm, physical aggression that causes significant injuries, murder, definitely. Yes, so those are those serious behaviors. Um, definitely want to intervene if we see those happening. And then we have the other undesirable category, which is junk behavior. So junk behavior is that behavior that is annoying. Um, it could be undesirable behavior, but it's not dangerous to anyone. Um, examples might be burping in public, interrupting others, um, just that junk behavior that it doesn't hurt anyone, but it really gets under your skin. It's quite annoying. Do you guys have any junk behaviors you can think of? Things that just really set your teeth on edge? Popping gum. Yeah, that's a good one. Um, screaming, singing out loud, talking loudly at the phone. Yeah, yeah, those those can all be annoying. Um, okay, very, very good examples. All right, so I'm gonna I'm gonna pick on your answer there, Charlie, as we talk about this next slide. So, we also need to remember when we are categorizing these behaviors that whether that behavior is considered desirable or undesirable often depends on the situation that's happening around that behavior. 
So Charlie said that screaming was a junk behavior. Um, can you guys think of a time when screaming might be a desirable behavior? Yeah, maybe when you're at the park or you're on the roller coaster, or you're at a baseball game. Yeah, those would all be good times to scream, right? You're excited. You're having fun. You're cheering on your team. Yeah, or maybe if you were warning someone of danger. Yeah, riding the roller coaster. Yep, those are all great examples. So I love that you put that out there, Charlie, because... We always have to look at what is going on around a behavior to decide whether it's desirable or undesirable. Um, and we have to recognize that behavior that someone has could be either depending on their level of skills um, and depending on just that situation in which the behavior is occurring. Very good. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about those significant desirable behaviors. Um, these are behaviors that we are trying to increase. And these are the behaviors that help people succeed in their life, help them have a higher quality of life. Um, if we were to go back and look at our list from earlier that we made of behaviors, um, do we have any significant desirable behaviors in our list? I'm not sure that we have any that we would, yeah, smiling probably would be the closest, I think, Wendy, that I would say um, would be a significant desirable behavior. But yeah, um, those are the behaviors that we do want to reinforce to help people have that higher quality of life. Um, these are also things that we want to point out when people are doing these behaviors so that we increase the likelihood that they're going to repeat those behaviors in the future. Um, a good example might be um, when you're in the store, a significant behavior might be paying for things before you use them or before you leave the store um, or only leaving the store with the items that you came in with or you paid for. So significant behaviors don't always have to be those life skills. They could just be um, things that we're expected to do, like to be good citizens, to be good people, but they're still significant desirable behaviors. And those just okay behaviors are, again, those behaviors that are common and they're often overlooked. We take them for granted. We usually only notice them when they don't happen. Um, so things like um, going to work, getting to work on time and doing your work. Most of us do that every day. We don't always get thanked for it or praised for it. Um, it's just one of those things that's expected. Um, it could be something like um, using an inside voice and not talking too loudly so that you don't disturb others. Those are things that we can start to recognize and reinforce when we see those happening. Um, and that increases the likelihood that we will see those behaviors continue to occur. And when we talk about junk behaviors, um, these are the ones that we usually spend all of our time and effort trying to stop. Um, they tend to upset us the most. Um, we've talked a little bit about the definition of junk behavior. Um, so just to reiterate, can you guys type in the chat box, what is your definition of junk behavior? Oh, 
Wendy says, behaviors focused on self without regard to self or others. Okay, yeah. So they're just kind of behaviors that maybe you do for yourself and you don't think about how they might come across to other people. Yeah, I like that definition. All right. So the true definition of junk behavior is that junk behavior is behavior that's undesirable. Um, it's often annoying, really, really annoying. Um, but it is not physically harmful to self, others, property, and it's not illegal. Um, we also often have to think about that junk behavior can be age or functional level appropriate. Um, for example, if you have little boys in your life around the age of eight or so, well, they really enjoy laughing and joking and burping and farting and and doing that together and laughing together. And that's a fairly appropriate junk behavior for that age frame, right? Um, we might think about younger kiddos, like maybe the toddler stage when they like to whine a lot and they have tantrums when they don't get their way. Well, that's a typical behavior for that age group as well. But just because that behavior is typical, it doesn't mean it's desirable to the rest of us. It doesn't mean it's any less annoying, um, but it does help to know that it's at least typical for that age group or that functional level. Um, the idea of how we respond to junk behavior uh, can really help us prioritize our concerns and our responses because it helps us save our energy and our frustration um, by not responding to that junk behavior. Um, we can really take a moment. We're going to talk a little bit later about a tool that we can use with junk behavior that really helps us manage our reactions um, and, and hopefully helps us decrease that episode of junk be those episodes of junk behavior um, and it helps us respond in a more positive way because remember junk behavior isn't hurting anyone it's just annoying mostly to others around that person who's having the junk behavior so what are some common junk behaviors that you guys have seen What are some of those junk behaviors that get into your, <laughs> like your, your chat there, Wendy, that girls do the same thing? They definitely do. <laughs> Tantrums is a good junk behavior. Yeah, those, those can definitely be annoying and hard to respond to, right? Especially when they're in public. What are some other junk behaviors? I will tell you one of my worst ones. My son is a percussionist and he is forever tapping on things. Like you can't sit down and have a conversation with him without him tapping something and making noise. And it, it's just natural to him, but it's really annoying to me. Charlie says hitting walls can be a junk behavior. Yeah, it can. Um, interrupting others. Yep, we got a couple of those interrupting. That's frustrating, isn't it? Yeah, those are, are definitely some good junk behaviors. Um, here's a few more examples. Um, cursing, threatening, not going to work, not being respectful, um, slamming doors, screaming, name calling, saying mean things. Um, if we were to go back to our list of behaviors that we made earlier, um, we have a couple of examples here, the not going to work and the not being respectful. And then back on our list of behaviors, we had one, I thought we had one that was not. So refusing to ambulate, um, that would kind of fall into that not category. Um, I want to bring that up specifically because when we use the word not in front of an action, it's not really a specific behavior. It's more of one of those category words. 
um, it doesn't really tell us what is happening. So can, you know, in saying not going to work, is that a behavior that I can observe that I can see and count? Um, what I really want to focus on there is what is happening instead of not going to work. Um, a little uh, activity that we can do is if I were to snap my fingers and every time I snap my fingers, you all type in the chat box something that I am not doing. So I'm going to, I'm going to start here. First snap, type in the chat box, something that I am not doing. I'm not clicking my teeth. <laughs> I'm not sleeping. I'm not eating. One more time. What am I not doing? I'm not laughing. Yeah, we we could come up with all kinds of things that I'm not doing, right? So we need to think about that when when we describe behavior, that we want to describe the behavior that actually is occurring um, instead of what is not occurring, uh, because it, it just becomes a category. It could become all kinds of different things that I am doing instead of whatever was described as not being done. So let's think a little bit about why people engage in junk behavior. Um, here's some examples. Um, why do people curse at someone else? And you can type that in the chat box. What's a good reason to curse at someone else? Why someone might be doing that? Fear, frustration, yeah, definitely. Maybe they're angry. Um, maybe it's just how they talk, right? Maybe it's just what they know, so they repeat that. Um, how about when people complain about food or groups or peers or whatever they want to complain about? Why do you think people complain? Why do they have that junk behavior? Yeah, Charlie says discomfort and Wendy says it meets a need. That's exactly right. Um, when we when we have people assuming that um, we need to ignore junk behavior, um, we have another tool that is much more effective than ignoring that behavior. Um, it's called pivot and we think it should be used all the time because junk behavior is happening all the time and it's really annoying and it needs to be addressed in a very effective way. So we're going to talk about pivot here shortly, but Wendy, you're exactly right when you say that that junk behavior meets a need. Um, if you think about the way behavior analysts look at the function of behavior, um, a lot of times, you know, they're looking at the antecedent or what happened before that behavior. They're looking at the actual behavior, and then they're looking at the consequence of that behavior. So the consequence might be that the individual gets attention. Um, they might get escape from whatever it is they were not wanting to do, um, or they might gain some sense of control by using that coercive junk behavior. Um, so we're, we're going to talk about pivot here shortly. Um, but it is a really effective tool that can help you respond in a better way to junk behavior. Uh, and just to reiterate, um, undesirable behavior is not junk behavior when that behavior um, causes physical 
damage to either oneself, others, property, or it's illegal. At that point, we always need to step in and intervene. Remember that junk behavior is often the precursor to serious behavior. Um, and so when we see that junk behavior happening, if we can respond to it appropriately, hopefully we can prevent serious behavior. Um, but this slide actually has a QR code about safety crisis planning. And so a safety crisis plan can help you identify maybe some of those triggers or those junk behaviors that in the past have led to an escalation um, where intervention was needed. Uh, this QR code will give you some more information about those crisis cycles and planning um, and setting up a safety crisis plan to help individuals know, um, okay, this is a precursor behavior to something that might escalate into something bigger. So how should I respond to that? Um, to get the individual to de-escalate and or how should I respond to the individual if they are escalated? How can I get them to de-escalate? And this next slide we have has information about the 988 number that you can call here in Missouri um, if you have serious behavior occurring or about to happen. Um, you can call this number and they will give you resources uh, and assistance and support for whatever crisis is happening at that moment. So here's some examples of those four categories of behavior that we've been talking about. Um, so significant behaviors. Again, those are the ones we really want to teach and encourage because they're going to help that person live a happy and healthier life, a more independent life. Um, and the more significant behaviors that an individual will have, the less likely we're going to see those problem behaviors. The just okay behaviors, remember, are usually those typical behaviors um, for an age or function level. Um, they're behaviors that we expect. Uh, the person may often do them and we might take them for granted until they're not done. Um, and if we continue to take the just okay behaviors for granted, we're likely to see those behaviors decrease um, in the amount of times the person is doing them because we're missing opportunities to encourage that desirable behavior. All right, and then we've hit on the serious and the junk behaviors pretty good, but there's some good examples of serious and junk behavior. We're going to jump forward now into some fundamental facts that help us understand behavior. The first one is that the behavior is always right given the person's environment and history. Um, what this means is that we will probably act the same way in a particular environment um, based on what we've always done, like what we've learned, our learning history. Um, it's not that people choose to have undesirable behaviors. They're not willfully being bad. Um, they're just doing what they've learned from experience, um, what they've watched others do, or they are telling us that something is wrong in their world and we have to understand that and then teach, model, and encourage the desirable behaviors. Um, behaviors often communicate what the person has learned to do in order to get what they need. And so we also want to be sure that we don't look at the behaviors that are happening and feel like individuals are just, that's just their personality. They're just born that way. They can't change. Um, we're not likely to be successful in helping them change behavior if we think that way. Um, if we also have the view that behavior comes out of nowhere for no apparent reason, 
then we're also probably not going to be successful in helping them change that behavior. Um, we really have to recognize that, as we've said earlier, behavior is always about trying to meet a need. And along with that comes that person's experiences and history um, that tell them what has worked in the past and what is probably going to work in the future based on all of their past experiences. But if we we can change that behavior, if we can recognize the behavior with the right consequences, um, and we can adjust what's happening in that environment to make changes that will encourage more desirable behaviors to occur. So the second fundamental fact um, is that consequences can strengthen or weaken a behavior. And the only way to know the effects of a consequence is to see what happens to that behavior in the future. Um, we've talked a little bit about this already in, in that ABC model of behavior analysts. Um, whether how we respond to a behavior can either strengthen that behavior and increase the likelihood that it's going to repeat in the future, or it can weaken that behavior. Um, and a lot, it's just based on our response. That's why we use positive behavior supports. We've talked a little bit too about how in our society, we have a tendency to use a negative punishment or consequences model um, in society. Like we see that in almost everything um, in our penal system, um, it, I mean, even as parents, a lot of times we feel like there needs to be some kind of negative consequence in order for a lesson to be learned. Um, but we need to recognize that, that that worsening effect that we usually try to give as a consequence doesn't always work in the way that we intended it to. Um, and the only way that you can measure whether your consequence is working is whether that behavior strengthens or weakens in the future, depending on what you're wanting it to do. And the third fundamental fact, it takes time for changes in the environment to change behavior. Um, we want and expect instant behavior change, right? Um, we want to, we want our kids to listen the first time we tell them. <laughs> Um, so we often think that telling, telling someone what you want them to do or stop doing, um, or putting a plan in, in place is going to immediately change that behavior. That's not true. Um, those behaviors took time to learn and develop and they take time to change. Um, we have to be consistent and persistent in using the same strategy to try to change that behavior over time. And we need to be watching and observing and taking data on whether this technique that we're using is working. Um, if it is working, we want to keep doing it. If it's not working, we probably want to tweak that technique or come up with a different plan to try to ensure that we are changing that behavior in the way that we want to. The fourth fundamental fact is that past behavior is the best predictor of all future behavior. Um, again, we are creatures of habit as humans. Um, I don't know about you, but when I'm in a class, I tend to sit in the same seat because it's comfortable. I drive the same route when I drive to work every every day. Um, we get in these these routines and habits and that's our past behavior being a predictor of the future behavior. Um, when we're trying to change behavior, uh, just recognize that it's difficult for people to step out of those routines and habits that they, they've learned or that they've done for the longest time. Um, and so we also want to make sure that we're attempting to problem solve what obstacles we might see in changing behavior and try to prevent those as much as we can. And the fifth fundamental fact is that giving those negative or coercive consequences 
usually results in more problems and more undesirable behaviors. We're going to talk about this one um, a, a little more in depth as we get into the coercions in a couple of slides here. Um, but as I've said earlier, uh, giving giving those negative and coercive punishments, we might see behavior change in the short term. Um, but in the long term, we're seeing some effects from using that negative type of consequence. And our sixth fundamental fact, um, in the long run, behavior responds better to positive consequences. Uh, we need to recognize what is being done well, and we need to provide positive consequences as often as possible. Um, those two things are going to help you increase the likelihood that you see those desirable behaviors repeated in the future. Um, and they're going to increase your positive relationship with that individual overall. Um, just a, a quick little example here. Think about um, in in the workplace. Have you ever had a boss who was not so supportive? Um, who was kind of a, I'm going to tell you what to do and you're going to do it and, and had the negative kind of punishing response. Um, and think about, did you put in 100% every single day for that negative coercive boss? Um, maybe on the other side, you've had a more supportive, uh, reinforcing boss who recognized the things that you did well. Um, who really supported you, uh, who, who, you know, told you all the time what a great job you were doing, recognized what you were doing well, were you, you were probably a lot more likely to, you were probably a lot more likely to put in more than 100% for that boss, right? Because you felt depreciated um, and you had a more positive relationship. So just remember that using these positive behavior supports um, in your responses can really help improve relationships. All right, so as we use these universal positive approaches with everyone we know, um, it's not really about trying to fix people and fix their undesirable behaviors. It's more about increasing the quality of life by building those more positive relationships with anyone you come in contact with. Um, it could be your family. It could be your coworkers. Um, could be your friends. Anyone you come in contact with, this is a positive approach that you can use with everyone. It's universal. So to effectively change behaviors, we always need to be um, teaching, finding, and paying more attention to those desirable behaviors. Um, I kind of preach this the whole way through that we want to point out what people are doing well, and we want to reinforce them for that, right? Um, whether it's a significant desirable behavior or a just okay behavior. Um, we want to be finding the things that they are doing well and recognizing them for it. And we want to make sure that we're recognizing the things they're doing well much more than we are pointing out things that they are doing that are undesirable. So as we think about that, what are some of those target behaviors that we might want to focus on? Um, Usually, they're behaviors that we want to teach or increase or replace, um, and we want to show people what the desirable behavior is, the alternative behavior um, that should be occurring rather than the undesirable behavior. Um, if we have desirable behaviors happening, by recognizing them, we can strengthen and increase those behaviors. Um, and we can weaken and decrease those undesirable behaviors when we focus on what to do um, instead of the undesirable behavior, um, or we focus our attention on the more desirable behaviors. Uh, as, as you're trying to implement this in your lives, um, 
you want to think about why focusing only on undesirable behaviors leads to poor outcomes. Um, if we're giving all of our time and attention to trying to fix people's behaviors and pointing out what they're doing wrong, um, we're not likely to see an increase of the desirable behaviors because the most attention is being given to that undesirable behavior. Um, positive behavior support is about switching our focus to recognizing what is being done well um, and, and increasing those positive interactions that we have. So let's talk about motivating desirable behavior. Um, sometimes the impression people have of positive practices is the idea that we're letting them get away with things if we don't give them a negative punishment. Um, in reality, what we're focusing on is putting more emphasis, um, either through our emotions, our words, our reactions, and our attention. We're focusing more on those desirable and healthy behaviors. And if we have to uh, react to undesirable behavior, then the way that we will do this is to give it as little attention as possible. Um, so we'll keep our reactions and our emotion and our words short um, and avoid eye contact if we can, avoid touching them. We want to make sure that we, we are not reinforcing that undesirable behavior in any way. So we want to keep our reaction to that undesirable behavior short and sweet and to the point. Um, and then we really want to make sure that we're kind of over the top in recognizing the desirable things that are happening. And like I just said, you don't want to focus on the on the undesirable or the inappropriate behaviors that you're wanting someone to stop. Um, instead, you want to focus on the desirable and healthy behaviors that you want the person to do. So those replacement behaviors for the undesirable behavior. Um, remember our list that we made of behavior? Our focus was a lot more on negative behaviors rather than positive behaviors. So we recognize that it's difficult to change your focus to the positive, um, but it is possible. It, it, it takes mindfulness, um, it takes commitment, but you will see huge improvements in your relationships if you are able to do this. Just like this slide says, changing behavior um, usually requires a change in your focus when you interact with them. Um, and again, remember that that behavior change happens slowly. Um, over time, sometimes you just see improvements. Um, you're not going to see perfection, and that's okay. Um, if you're better than where you started, that's a win, right? Um, and above all else, you have to be patient, not only with the behaviors that you're trying to change in others, but be patient with yourself. Um, in learning how to change your focus more towards the positive. Um, it's hard. It's really, really hard sometimes. And so, yeah, you just have to have patience all the way around. So let's get into some of the coercions. Um, these are those negative responses that we often use. Um, and we're going to talk about the effects that happen when we use those negative responses. So coercion is typically a way that we punish others. Um, we have a very coercive culture. Uh, we all use coercion. It's a cultural habit. Um, we're not picking on anybody. It's a problem for everybody. Um, and even though we may not realize it or plan it, we're doing we're using that coercion to try to make someone's behavior stop um, and the more each of us can avoid coercion the more all of us will be better off because we're all more focused on the positive um so i'm going to give you a few examples of how our society is coercive just our culture in general and then i'd like you to 
think about what are some of the ways that our society is coercive, that we're just built around this this model of negative punishment. Um, for example, let's say speeding tickets. Um, we, no, we never get stopped for going the speed limit, right? We don't get recognized for doing the right thing. We get stopped when we break the law and we're speeding and we get a ticket. Uh, can you guys think of any other ways, like just in society, in our culture, of how we use that, that negative coercive model of punishment? Any examples? Um, another one might be when we're when someone is late to work and they get docked pay, so they get that negative consequence of being late to work. Well, you guys are thinking and typing there. Um, just recognize that as a culture, we've been coercive for a very long time. It's very ingrained in what we do, and it seems very natural. And that's why it's really hard to change, and it takes some real effort um, and continued efforts at improving and trying to change our way of thinking to this positive behavior support um, where it's not punishing, but it's recognizing the positive. So Charlie put in the chat box here, having to pay extra fees when he pays bills late. Yeah, that one is, yeah, <laughs> definitely a coercive negative consequence. Um, or like, yeah, Wendy says when someone is talking in class and they get written up or they get a detention, um, they get that negative consequence for talking in class. Yeah, like we see it, especially in the school system, in the legal system. Very punishing. So when we try to teach others by punishing them, um, we're actually corroding the relationship that we have with them. Um, we're not teaching the behavior that we want. We're not showing them a replacement behavior. Um, we're just, uh, we're really just modeling um, behaviors that we don't want. We're motivating and teaching behaviors we don't want. Um, I always think about the example of like little kiddos when they play house, you know, like four or five and they like to play house and they might take their baby doll um, and say, oh, you've been so bad and they'll spank their baby doll. Well, that's what they were taught um, when they received a spanking is, is that that punishment is what we do when someone does something bad. Um, we We need to recognize that um, by changing our focus to this more positive behavior support model, um, we will see better outcomes um, with our with everyone that we come into contact with. We're going to see more positive relationships. Um, another example might be uh, if you think about our legal system, the juvenile justice system and, and the Department of Corrections, we see 70% or more of people who have a recidivism rate, they end up back in the same place. So that is telling us that our negative model of consequence is not changing anyone's behavior. Um, you see positive behavior supports, it started in the school-wide system. Um, and schools that were able to implement that have seen huge improvements in their students having better outcomes. 
um, higher graduation rates, fewer office referrals or suspensions, better academic performance, um, and that there's more time actually being able to be spent teaching versus having to react to undesirable behavior. Um, so positive behavior supports can really, really change how you interact with others, and it can help you change behavior of others. So let's talk a little bit about the word discipline. Um, discipline is a word that usually comes across as kind of negative, right? We, we usually think of discipline meaning some type of strict punishment or negative consequences. Um, but actually, the word discipline uh, is, means something that is taught. So like math, science, and English are disciplines. Um, if we are using punishment as our discipline, what are we actually teaching, modeling, and motivating others to do? Um, we're not motivating them in doing those desirable behaviors. We're motivating them to continue this negative punishment model, right? We're motivating them to continue to use coercion. Um, we're going to look at some of the examples of those 10 coercions we've talked about over the next few slides. Um, and then we're also going to be talking about that pivot tool that we can use to help us respond to junk behavior uh, coming up here in just a little bit. So this is just uh, an overview slide of the 10 examples of common coercions that we all use. Um, as we go through and get a little deeper into what these look like, um, I want you to be thinking about which ones really resonate with you. Um, as I said earlier, we are all human, we're all coercive. I know I have a couple of favorites on this list that are my fallbacks that I, I use more frequently than others. Um, so as we talk about them, just be thinking about which ones maybe you have a tendency to fall back on, and then we'll share when we get done going over each of these. So the first coercion is questioning. This is when you are asking an individual questions that you don't want answered. You're just asking questions to make them feel um, to make them feel bad, make them feel guilty um, or dumb. Uh, just basically, you're just trying to make them feel bad. I think about as your your kiddo comes in late from curfew and and you ask all those questions. Where have you been? Um, didn't you have a phone? Why didn't you call? Um, I can't believe you, you've done this. You know, what were you doing? All of those kinds of questions that you just kind of fire at them, rapid response, and you don't want them to respond to any of the questions. You're just saying them to make them feel bad. So, yeah. And then the second coercion that we have here is arguing. I'm sure we're all familiar with.
argument and we we didn't come to a compromise um, and no one changed their viewpoint. So arguing is considered a coercion. Um, it's one of those that we should definitely try to avoid. And our next coercion is sarcasm or teasing. Um, this would be one of my favorites. And I really think that in our society, we value sarcasm as, as like a quick wit um, and we find it funny. But sarcasm is where you say the opposite of what you mean, where you make fun of someone either maliciously or playfully. Um, a couple of the problems with sarcasm are that um, you're being insincere. When you use sarcasm, you're often trying to humiliate the other person in some way, like to, to make fun or point out what they've done wrong um, in that playful way. Um, a lot of times, if you're using sarcasm with an individual who may not have a high level of functioning, um, they're taking you at face value for what you're saying. And so they don't understand the social cue of, of sarcasm and they they believe everything that you're saying. So they're taking, you know, maybe you're making fun of them, but they're taking it as a compliment. Um, we just we really want to try to avoid sarcasm. It's something that can loud and close. Um, it, it puts people in that control model of like you being over the other person as you're forcefully um, verbally yelling at them, or maybe even you're physically moving them somewhere that they don't want to go. Um, physical force can be seen as abuse and it will be dealt with in the system. Um, we do recommend that if there's any type of physical force being used in the work environment, that there be training of crisis management techniques um, so that we can make sure that those are being done in a safe manner. Um, and, and the context of that situation will also be observed to make sure that it's not falling onto the side of abuse. So verbal force, um, physical force, the example. And then we have threats. Um, so threats are when we are um, pointing out all the bad things that will happen if this person doesn't follow through with what you've asked them to do, if they don't stop this undesirable behavior. Um, we're basically just threatening them with all of the bad things that might happen. Um, the problem with, with threats is that we're not reminding individuals
happen if they met the expectation or if they did what was necessary. Um, I'm sure you all can think of some threats that that you have heard or made <laughs> to your children if your parents. Um, do you guys have any examples of like a threat that you might have heard or given? And a lot of times we're making sure that they're doing it in the way that we think it should be done. Um, so when we do that, it, I, and I'm sure you guys have had this example of, you know, maybe even your kids or, or even my husband, like if I've asked him to do something and it wasn't done to my expectation. And so I, I might criticize him and tell him how I do it, but that comes across coercively. Um, some better ways to uh, help someone get things done in the manner that would be the most desirable, you might say something like, I've got a suggestion that could help, or I, I think I might have a better solution. Um, and, or 